Thank you very much, Dr. Sajid Tedri Singha, for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, and I also welcome you all, uh, the, all the participants uh, who are joining here today uh, after actually a very eventful day, I must say. At, uh, yeah, it was quite a day, quite a day actually. Uh, maybe some of some of uh, some of the, the the people who actually wanted to participate maybe kind of uh, stuck in the roads or maybe uh, still uh, at the protest. Anyway, uh, 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 it's quite unfortunate, but uh, it's kind of my duty to uh, conduct conduct uh, today's session. So I believe that uh, maybe uh, we can make the recording available for everyone. So for those who could not participate today, so they can uh, go through the, the video later and get the, the best out of it. Uh, having said that, I welcome you all to today's webinar. Uh, we are going to discuss about how to improve fuel economy of your vehicle and as uh, Dr. Sajit already mentioned, I am Lihil Subhasimha, a senior lecturer from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Morocco. Okay, let's begin. Now, before going into the details or, or uh, how to reduce the fuel economy, let's try to understand about what is fuel economy and what are the factors that uh, are affecting the fuel economy. Starting with um, the, let's start with what is actually fuel economy. It's we all know that it is something depends on the distance traveled by a vehicle and the amount of fuel consumed. Usually, in our country, in most of the vehicle, uh, the the fuel economy is measured in terms of kilometers per liter, kilometers per liter. That is. Uh, the usual convention uh, that is used in our country. So we basically say that maybe if it is a bike, we call it like we say that maybe uh, uh, 60 kilometers per liter or maybe even 80 kilometers per liter if it is a bike. And if it is a hybrid vehicle, maybe it's somewhere around uh, between 20 to 30 kilometers per liter. Uh, if it is a conventional vehicle, conventional, uh, maybe a petrol engine car, uh, it's somewhere between uh, if it if uh, it has an automatic transmission system maybe it's somewhere around 10 to 15 kilometers per liter in that range basically but if it is a manual transmission based vehicle then uh, maybe uh, you can go like somewhere between 15 to 17 or 18 usually usually the if the when we compare two vehicles having the same same specifications or same engine capacity, but the only difference is that one is having an automatic transmission system and one is having a manual transmission system. And usually the, the one with the manual transmission system is more fuel, uh, more economical than the, the automatic transmission system. I believe that that is something that you may already know. So in some vehicles, yes, it is also given in, uh, uh, liters per 100 kilometers. So some, some vehicles or some vehicles manufactured for different regions of the world, this uh, unit of uh, uh, this unit also can be seen, like how many liters per 100 kilometer. So these two can be seen in, in most of our vehicles that we see in our day-to-day -day life. Then, what are the parameters that the fuel economy, fuel economy basically depends on? So there are various parameters, starting with the fuel consumption characteristics of the engine. So engine itself is a parameter. And the transmission system, whether it is a conventional automatic transmission, whether it is a continuously variable transmission system or the CVT, or is it some kind of a manual transmission system, a conventional manual transmission system? So it depends on the transmission system, the fuel economy also varies. And the weight of the vehicle, weight of the vehicle, yes. And the aerodynamic resistance, it's like uh, when the vehicle is moving forward, 
we all know that the wind is flowing in the opposite direction. Therefore, the wind is actually pushing the vehicle backwards. So that wind resistance, we usually call it as the aerodynamic resistance or aerodynamic drag. Then the rolling resistance of the tires. That is very simple that I believe we all learned about this uh, uh, in our levels, basically for physics, that the friction between the tires and the road. So the friction is again a kind of a resistance to the, the forward movement of the vehicle. So that also, the higher the resistance, higher the rolling resistance, then it will increase the fuel consumption of the vehicle. And the driving conditions, depending on what type of a road that we are traveling, whether the road has uh, uh, steep hills or it's kind of going downhill, or the road is having uh, plenty of potholes and so on, the driving conditions, and whether it's in, uh, uh, there's a plenty of traffic in front of us, or is, is it some kind of a stop and go conditions all the time, city driving, highway driving, likewise, the driving conditions also depends on, uh, is affecting on the fuel economy. Finally, the driver's behavior. Yes, as drivers, yes, we, there's some part of the fuel economy also depends on us, the way how we drive the vehicle. So that is, uh, if I'm going to give you some tips and tricks uh, in the upcoming slides. If you have some kind of a bad habit of driving, so maybe, this session uh, a bit helpful for you to maybe to try to uh, change some of the, the 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 driving behaviors so that you may be able to improve the fuel economy of your vehicle. Then, then we are going to the, the important part. Okay, like you don't need to spend uh, like no waste time. So basically, we simply going to how to improve the fuel economy. So what are the tips and tricks uh, uh, based to improve the fuel economy of your vehicle? Before going into the steps, okay, before going into the various different ways to improve the fuel economy, let's try to figure out, figure it out, uh, what is the, uh, the, the part of the engine or what is the role of an engine of a vehicle and how the engine characteristics uh, affecting the fuel economy of the vehicle. So this may be something new for all of you. Some of you may have seen this, but I believe that most of you may have not seen this if you are not from a uh, uh, mechanical engineering background. This actually shows you an example, engine performance curves of a standard uh, petrol engine. Okay, now in this figure, in this graph, you can see that there are four, sorry, three different parameters shown in this figure. Okay, starting with the power, engine power, engine power variation with respect to the engine RPM. RPM stands for revolutions per minute. I believe in your vehicle, some of the, some of the vehicles, uh, usually you can see the RPM meter, RPM meter right next to the speedometer. So usually if it is a petrol vehicle, the yeah, petrol car usually, uh, the RPM starts from zero to uh, maybe around 8,000 RPMs. So it's like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, until eight. So that eight, all the numbers, you need to multiply it by thousand. That is how the, the RPM is uh, denoted in your uh, instrument cluster the dashboard in front of you from zero to 8,000. If, uh, if it is a bike, if it is a bike, usually it goes up to like uh, 10,000 RPM or 11,000, 12,000. Usually the bike engine, in, bikes, bike engines usually have a very high RPM. If it is a diesel vehicle, diesel vehicle, usually the RPM range is some, somewhere between zero to 6,000 RPM, 7,000 RPM. Usually the, the RPM range of a diesel engine is significantly uh, smaller than the RPM or the maximum RPM of a petrol engine, a similar kind of a petrol engine. So that is about the RPM and these curves are about 
the power fluctuation or the power variation with respect to the engine RPM and the torque, the engine torque variation, the torque and power. Okay, I believe you, the torque is measured in the Newton meters. Okay, so like, like what we have learned in physics, uh, the torque and the power of the engine, the power output of the engine, usually measured in terms of kilowatt. And um, there's another parameter here that is the specific fuel consumption of the vehicle. And it is uh, measured in terms of grams of fuel, grams of fuel per kilowatt hour, per kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hour is a unit for uh, energy, okay? The, it's kind of a unit saying that uh, per unit of energy, how much or how much grams of fuel needs to be combusted per what like how much grams of fuel needs to be combusted per one kilowatt hour uh, energy output from the engine. By looking at this figure, you can clearly see that the torque here. Now you can see that the vehicle provides you the maximum amount of torque in this particular engine. The maximum amount of torque is somewhere around uh, uh, approximately somewhere around 2200 or 2300 RPM. Okay. If we draw a line like this, you can see that the maximum torque is somewhere around 2200 in this particular engine, right? So this figure is usually uh, varies from one engine to another, but basically, this is how it usually looks like. And the maximum power of the engine, you can achieve it somewhere around 4,500 RPM, okay? At a very high RPM, the maximum power. This is something that usually we do not need as a domestic driver, okay? This maximum power point, this region could be very useful for the people who are uh, kind of driving race cars. So, so the, at this particular RPM, the engine provides you the maximum power. But as domestic drivers, usually uh, the vehicles that are manufactured for domestic purposes, uh, the engine is designed in such a way that when the vehicle is actually can, so when the engine can, can give you the maximum amount of torque, that region is used as the, the uh, designed in such a way that that region gives you some kind of the uh, the best specific fuel consumption as you can see that in this particular engine the best fuel consumption is somewhere around 3000 rpm okay somewhere around 3000 rpm at 3000 rpm the engine is not actually giving the maximum torque but a significant amount of high torque it can provide so if, if you think about the range, 2000 RPM to 3000 RPM range, this particular range, you can see that within this range, the fuel consumption is significantly low. The fuel consumption is significantly low and the torque output, the torque of the engine is somewhat high, somewhat high. So within this range, the engine is actually providing you a significant amount of torque while consuming less fuel. If you think about 3,000 to 4,000 range, you can see that within that range, the fuel consumption uh, gradually starts increasing, okay, from 3,000 to 400, 4,000, and simultaneously, you are losing the torque as well. You are losing the torque. So, while losing the torque, increasing the fuel consumption is not actually good. Therefore, what we need to do is usually need to try, try to find what is the sweet spot of your engine, the sweet spot or sweet RPM spot or the sweet RPM range. So within that RPM range, according to this figure, we can say that the sweet RPM range is somewhere between 2,000 RPM to 3,000 RPM. Within this range, the engine gives you a significant amount of torque while consuming less fuel. That is the science behind the sweet spot of an engine. Okay, that is one of the reasons. That is one of the reasons why um, uh, 
if you uh, i believe that if you do not have if you have a conventional car conventional petrol engine vehicle uh, i believe that if it is not a hybrid one then i believe you have to go to uh, what do you call uh, the 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 green testing stations or the or the the emissions testing uh, locations like the the eco uh, the, the the drive green or the eco street so you have to go there once a once once a year and test your vehicle for emissions now there are two parameters that they are checking one parameter is the uh, the hydrocarbon emissions and uh, the carbon monoxide emissions so I, yes as i remember yes hc and co carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon those two emissions at two different rpms one is the idling rpm idling rpm means once the engine is started you just leave the engine like that no acceleration what is the fuel consumption or the what is the hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide emissions uh, at the idle rpm and if you check your uh, emissions testing certificate the second parameter that they are checking is the fuel consumption or the the, the hydrocarbon and the carbon monoxide emissions at a particular rpm if you remember that rpm that rpm is 2500 rpm 2500 rpm so the very reason why they have selected that particular rpm is that mainly the the vehicles that are produced for domestic usage usually the sweet rpm the sweet spot is somewhere between 2000 to 3000 so that is the reason why in the emissions testing uh, the the that value that measurement is done at 2500 rpm nothing else nothing else just because of this because that is kind of the sweet spot of the engine so what you need to do is that if you are a skillful driver or if you are going to be a, 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 a kind of going to practice this then you need to try to maintain the rpm of your engine within this range within the sweet range therefore you can actually improve the fuel economy of your vehicle just by maintaining the rpm of the engine so that is the first thing that is the first thing so in order to do that in order to do that in order to maintain your engine rpm within that range what we can do first thing avoid hard acceleration avoid hard acceleration gradually increase the speed without revving the engine too much okay if you are trying to rev or increase the rpm or accelerate uh, rev the engine maybe beyond 4000 beyond 5000 or if you if you flow the accelerator pedal if you flow or push the accelerator pedal to the bottom then you will realize that, that the engine rpm is kind of increasing and when you increase the engine rpm you will realize that you are losing when you go increase the engine rpm you are losing the fuel economy this fuel consumption is kind of gradually increasing try to stay within the sweet rpm range but remember there's very important thing that don't be too slow otherwise you will be a hindrance to the smooth traffic flow like if there is a long tail behind okay if there's a long tail just behind your car and if you are very slowly accelerating so you might save some fuel but uh, adversely it will affect the people behind you okay so if you have a very long tail uh, then i must say that maybe a bit be a bit considerate about the others so in such occasion okay try to accelerate a bit more and let the others to follow okay if there is no tail behind you then maybe you can practice this but always try to be considerate because maybe you are saving some fuel but because of the delay uh, imposed by you uh, could be could affect the people behind you to uh, increase the fuel economy of their vehicles because that you are too slow so that part is also there then the stop and go conditions in stop and go conditions now 
I'm going to explain this uh, in, in three different stages or three different classes of vehicles, starting with a conventional IC engine vehicle, not a hybrid one, a vehicle with the conventional IC engine vehicle. In a stop and go conditions, yes, like in the previous case, do not accelerate too much, gradually increase the speed without revving the engine and try to stay within the sweet RPM range. So that is basically the same. If your vehicle is a mild hybrid vehicle, now you may be wondering what is a mild hybrid vehicle. So you can, uh, you can find a mild hybrid vehicle. Now, when the vehicle is stopped, when the vehicle is stopped and when the vehicle starts gradually moving forward, once you start accelerating the vehicle, once you push the accelerator pedal, if the engine immediately starts, okay, once you push the accelerator pedal, maybe slightly, if the engine immediately starts, okay, without having a full electric mode, okay, there are some hybrids which has a full electric mode. Once you push the accelerator pedal briefly, then the vehicle will move uh, just because, uh, I mean, uh, with the support of the motor. But in mild hybrids, once you push the accelerator pedal, immediately the engine will start. For example, the Honda Insight. Honda Insight, the 2011, 2012, 2013 models of Honda Insight. It's a mild hybrid. And Honda Fit GP1 and basically the Suzuki Wagon R. Wagon R, all these vehicles are mild hybrid vehicles. Now, in a mild hybrid, you need to gradually increase the speed, very similar to the previous case, without revving the engine too much and let the motor to assist the acceleration. In a mild hybrid, the motor is actually supporting the acceleration in the initial stages. If you accelerate too much, then the engine will take over everything. Engine will give you the maximum power it can produce and accelerate the vehicle very quickly, consuming more fuel. But if you gradually accelerate, then a little bit of uh, work will be done by the engine and the majority of the work will be done by the motor with the support of the battery pack, obviously, yes. So if you gradually rev or gradually increase the RPM, then the motor will be able to do more work than the engine. Therefore, you will be saving some amount of fuel. If it is a, like, if it is a Honda car, Honda car, no, Honda Insight, this picture is actually from a Honda Insight. There's a nice indicator that they have introduced to the dashboard. You can see the, under the speed gauge, you can see the dial, it's in different colors, blue, green, and red. If it is in blue color, that means the engine, the motor is actually assisting the acceleration. So stay within that blue region. Okay, do not go into the red region. That means the, the engine is giving maximum amount of power. So that basically you are consuming more fuel. So try to stay within this blue region. That means the motor is doing uh, majority of the work. That is about mild hybrids. Now, what about full hybrids? Full hybrid vehicles, Toyota Prius, Aqua, CHR, Honda, Honda Fit GP5, Honda Vessel, Honda Grace, all the recent models, all are full hybrid vehicles. Full hybrid vehicles means it has a full electric mode. When in a stop and go condition, once you accelerate it slowly, then uh, motor is the, the power source. Motor is the, the, tr the, the traction force to move the vehicle in the initial stages. Uh, the engine is, simply does not turn on. If the battery is charged, if the battery is charged, if the battery has enough charge capacity, then the battery will drive the motor and the motor will drive the vehicle without even having any support from the engine. Now, in stop and go conditions, if it is a hybrid vehicle, you try to accelerate gradually, accelerate gradually without uh, starting the engine during the acceleration stage, okay? So it is like this figure is from a, 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 a Toyota Aqua, 
the Toyota Aqua dashboard. This is actually this provides you some kind of an idea about uh, uh, how the engine, the vehicle is pro producing energy, or how the engine is providing you power. This figure, this gauge, it has four segment, four segment, four major segments. Here, this is the the segment which provides you the charging action, or if the indicator is in this CHG region, that means the engine or the braking system is currently charging the battery. Okay, if it is in this CHG, I believe this you already know. And this echo region, echo region, it has two segments. Okay, this region which can, you can see a very bright white. Uh, uh, the the light of the white line here it's thicker is thicker than the white line here this region this region majority of the work is done by the motor majority of the work done by the motor if the battery is fully charged or the if the battery is having a full capacity like this or maybe if if the battery has some amount of charge when you accelerate when you accelerate in a stop and go condition, try to stay within this region. Try to stay within this region. As long as you stay within this region, engine will not start. Basically, the engine will not start. Okay. If you go beyond this region, even though you are in the echo, echo region, if you go beyond this region, beyond this region, beyond this point, actually, beyond this point, and then this from here to here. The engine will automatically turn on. Then the both the motor and the engine will provide the energy or provide power to the vehicle to move forward. If you go into this power region, okay, so that means the engine is kind of revving at a very high RPM. So the engine is actually providing you all the power that it has. So yes, you will be able to accelerate very quickly but in the expense of more, more and more fuel. Therefore, in a stop and go condition, okay, always try to stay within this region. Stay within this region. Basically, that region is called as the, the EV region. EV region. If the battery is charged, then within this region, the engine will not start. But let's say if the battery is fully depleted, fully depleted, then there's no other choice like even though you try to rev within this region the engine will automatically turn on because there's no energy in the battery pack to drive the motor in such cases even though you are in this region this ev region the engine will start engine will start but remember the engine will uh, maintain at a very low rpm very low rpm uh, while like providing you enough power to accelerate while maintaining the fuel, while maintaining the fuel economy at a significantly higher level, so fuel consumption at a lower level. So that is how basically you you can accelerate in a very economical way in a stop and go conditions. This actually valid for Toyota Aqua, Toyota Prius. Usually, uh, this. Uh, uh, for Toyota vehicles, this kind of uh, graph or this kind of uh, uh, meter gauge is, is there for all the Toyota hybrid vehicles. So I believe that you, you try this, you try this. If you haven't uh, tried this before, then uh, check, whether, check whether, it, whether it is true or not. Okay. Then, uh, this is basically the stop and go conditions, but uh, all less again, I need to tell you, don't be too slow. Uh, if there's pretty much of traffic behind you, then don't be too slow. Okay, gradually increase the RPM until you get the speed without being a hindrance to the people behind you. Then I come to another interesting one. Don't stay idle for long. Okay, so let's say you are on, in a traffic and your vehicle is uh, kind of idling. 
engine is on uh, in the start in the started state, but the engine is idling, maybe somewhere around about eight. 800 rpm or 1000 rpm usually for a petrol vehicle petrol engine that is the idling rpm about 1800 between 800 to 1000 most of these modern vehicles they are already equipped with the engine starts of function okay then you do not need to worry okay uh, when you are stopped in a traffic the, the, the vehicle will automatically turn off the engine then you do not need to worry the vehicle itself uh, is going to save some fuel for you. Now, the problem is, what if, what if your vehicle does not have such a system? Okay, let's say your vehicle does not have an automatic uh, start stop function or idle stop function. Now, is it okay? The next question is, is it okay to turn on and off engine multiple times in a traffic? Is it okay? Is it good? Good for the engine? Now, for that question, there was a study. There was a study done by Matsura, Korematsu, and Tanaka uh, in 2004. 2004. So they tested uh, two vehicles, two similar vehicles, one with uh, automatic engine starts of function and another one without engine starts of function. This paper is actually available in the, uh, in the SA technical paper. If you click on this link, uh, the paper, the, the, it will direct you to the, uh, the, 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 the study. According to their study, if you are going to idle your engine for more than seven seconds, that means you are wasting fuel. Okay? If you are going to stay in the traffic, Okay, stand still in the traffic for more than seven seconds, then shutting down the engine and restarting the engine when you need to go is more economical, more economical than keeping the engine idling. If you are going to stop for less than seven seconds, less than seven seconds, then keeping the engine running, that is fine. That is fine. Because it's like, uh, if you switch off immediately, let's say, uh, before, like immediately, uh, once you stop, you immediately switch off the vehicle and then within two seconds, let's say you need to switch on the engine and move forward. So the seven seconds means it is actually the amount of fuel that is required. It represents the amount of fuel that is required to start the engine. Okay. So, if your vehicle is idling for seven seconds, the amount of fuel that is consumed by the engine within that seven seconds is equal to the amount of fuel that is required for that engine to restart. Therefore, if you are waiting for more than seven seconds, then it is always good to turn off your engine, turn off your engine. So there is a, actually a scientific study uh, done by uh, these uh, two Japanese uh, researchers, Japanese researchers. Actually, this is uh, a university-based research. If you want to uh, know more about this, okay, there's a very nice video here. There's a very nice video here. This is the link, okay? Or otherwise, you can simply search in the YouTube like, uh, uh, fuel economy, uh, less than seven seconds, something like that, and then uh, it will direct you to this particular link. So seven seconds is the, 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 the limit, the limit. But there will be another question that you might have. In. Yes, it will add additional stress to your lead acid battery because a conventional lead acid battery, it is not designed it is not designed for multiple start stops within one single trip. Okay, for one single trip, that means one starting, one starting. But a conventional lead acid battery, it is not designed to have multiple number of starts and stops during one single trip. For such applications, there are different variants of batteries like uh, the AGM batteries. Uh, absorb absorbent glass mat 
battery. So it is kind of a type of a lead acid battery, AGM. Uh, if you are kind of uh, interested in uh, uh, like uh, off-grid systems these days, I believe you may have heard about these AGM batteries. You may have seen some of the advertisements in uh, in uh, ikman.lk or in, in websites about AGM batteries, advanced uh, glass matte batteries. Even I think some of the manufacturers, some of the importers are currently uh, importing this type of battery because uh, these are come somewhat better uh, to be used with uh, the inverter system than the conventional lead acid batteries. So they, these AGM batteries, oh, like uh, they are designed to withstand for multiple start stop functions, uh, start stop cycles. So if you already have a lead acid battery and uh, it is kind of weak already, then uh, if you try to do this, then maybe uh, the lifespan of your lead acid battery will be a uh, bit lessened. Okay, it will be decreased, but on the other hand, you will be able to save some fuel. Okay. The next one is practice smooth braking. Okay. So smooth braking means now, uh, if you are kind of having a habit of, let's say, once you see a ob uh, obstacle in front of you, if you see an obstacle in front of you, and uh, there's a significant amount of distance from from uh, uh, from you to the obstacle. So maybe you are kind of maintaining the same speed and once you get closer to the obstacle and then that is the point that you start applying brakes. So that is not actually a very good practice. So once you see an obstacle in front of you, you need to start braking gradually, gradually, slowing down the vehicle gradually because Let's say the obstacle in front of you gets the green light. Let's say if it is a traffic stop and gets the green light and the obstacle starts moving forward. Then since you are gradually braking and the speed is gradually reducing, then when the obstacle is gone, you do not have to accelerate the vehicle too much because you already have some speed because you reduce the speed very gradually. Let's say if you are going to have a hard break, okay, and you are going to stop very closer to the obstacle. And once you are kind of very closer to the obstacle, like you are going to stop, just, just now you are going to stop and the obstacle moves forward, okay? The obstacle or the vehicle in front of you gets the green light. Then what you need to do in order to catch up with that vehicle, then you are going to hit the accelerator very hard, okay? just to catch up, keep maintain the gap between the vehicle in front of you because the vehicle just started moving forward and then you need to catch up, you are going to accelerate really hard. That means the re-acceleration, okay, in such conditions, re-acceleration consume more fuel because the engine is going to go into the high RPM range because you are demanding the engine to accelerate quickly, then the fuel will be combusted. More and more fuel will be combusted. So that is basically about a conventional vehicle, conventional, not a hybrid one. So practice smooth braking, practice smooth braking. By practicing smooth braking, it is also beneficial for hybrid vehicles in big time. Okay, because if you depress the brake pedal gently, once you see an obstacle, let's say maybe obstacle is a bit far ahead of you, but you depress the brake pedal gently, gently, so that the regenerative brake system, it will have ample amount of time. It will have more than enough time to harvest all the kinetic energy of the wheels that are rotating, harvest the kinetic energy, and store that kinetic energy in the batteries in, in the form of chemical energy. And the battery will be charged due to that regenerative braking action. Simultaneously, the vehicle will gradually slow down. You wanted to slow down the vehicle. Yes, you can see an obstacle in front of you. Then uh, by applying brakes very smoothly, 
and let the regenerative braking system to charge the battery. Okay, give the regenerative braking system ample amount of time to charge the battery. So that smooth braking in a hybrid vehicle will be very beneficial, highly beneficial for you to uh, uh, charge the battery pack from the from the uh, the regenerative braking action. So remember that. Then comes to another important part that is about maintain constant speed while cruising. Okay, cruising means basically, let's say you are maintaining same speed, maintaining a same speed. Let's say if you are driving on a highway, okay, specifically a flat highway, flat highway, okay, the highway is flat. Okay, no ups and downs, no hills and uh, valleys, just flat highway. In a flat highway, maintain a constant speed. Maintain a constant speed. Okay, so uh, maintaining a constant speed means that, okay, it's not a very high speed or not a very low speed. Basically, uh, what you need to do is Hit the sweet spot, hit the sweet RPM, hit the sweet RPM, maybe 2500 RPM. So you reach that particular RPM and then maintain that speed, maintain the speed. But depending on the vehicle and the, the transmission system as well as the road conditions, once you reach 2500 RPM, let's say the sweet spot of your vehicle, for that RPM, the speed of the vehicle could vary from one vehicle to another. At 2500 RPM, one vehicle could be like traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. Another vehicle at the same RPM may be traveling at 80 kilometers per hour. One vehicle may be just 50 kilometers per hour, depending on the engine. Basically, depends on the engine capacity, engine capacity, and also the depends on the transmission system. But as long as you can maintain that speed, so maintaining that RPM. So according to that RPM, you will obtain a, some kind of a speed, some kind of a speed. As long as you maintain that speed, it's not too fast, not too slow. Okay. Uh, then your fuel efficiency, fuel economy will be very high. Okay. Highly improved. Because what I'm saying that the high speeds are not good because when the vehicle is traveling really fast, this is something related to aerodynamics, by the way. Uh, when, when the vehicle speed increases, the aerodynamic drag or the wind resistance also increases. The aerodynamic drag is actually pro uh, uh, directly proportional, okay? Directly proportional to the, the speed of the vehicle squared, V squared, speed of the vehicle squared. So, when the speed of the vehicle increases, the aerodynamic drag, that force also increases. That means the air is kind of trying to push the vehicle backwards. So you need to uh, work against the aerodynamic drag. Then uh, the engine needs to do more and more work, which means you are going to uh, consume more fuel. And in the same time, when the engine is engine and all the parts of the engine are, or the vehicle are rotating at very high speeds, then the mechanical losses also becomes very significant. Lower the speeds, if you drive at a very low speed, then your gearbox, the gearbox will downshift, okay, go to lower gears. When you go into the lower gears, the engine RPM will increase. I believe you all know that uh, at lower RPMs, the engine RPM is high. At higher gears, maybe let's say if it is a manual car and if you are in a fifth gear, then the engine RPM is very low. When let's say you are traveling at four, uh, 50 kilometers per hour in fifth gear. In fifth gear, maybe the RPM at 50 kilometers per hour may be around 2000 RPM. But the same speed, 50 kilometers per hour, but in the fourth gear, maybe the RPM is about maybe about 3000 RPM. So when you go into the low, lower speeds, then obviously you cannot actually go to the fifth gear or the highest gear, then the engine 
okay if it is a automatic transmission then uh, engine will go come to the lower gears the lower gears means the higher the rpm higher rpm means engine will start consuming more fuel and also significant amount of energy of the combustion combustion will be wasted at as heat okay like uh, we all know that the heat is kind of uh, the engine is rejecting heat to the atmosphere due to the combustion but at lower speeds since uh, the total power output of the engine is not utilized to drive the wheels but the majority of the power is kind of wasted as heat and mechanical losses so try to stay within that sweet spot this is a very important thing if it is a flat road okay if it is a flat road then you can use the cruise control if your vehicle has cruise control then you can rev the vehicle to the sweet rpm or sweet rpm and then set the speed set the speed at that rpm and let's say you when your vehicle is revved to 2500 rpm then the speed is about uh, 70 kilometers per hour and then you set it set the cruise cruising speed then Yes, obviously the fuel consumption will be marvelous. The thing is, if the highway is having very steep hills, like you need to go up a very steep hill. If you set the engine speed, or if you set the vehicle speed to a particular value, when you are trying to uh, go uphill, okay, on the highway, if you try to go uphill, then the engine will automatically increase the engine rpm it will automatically increase the rpm in order to maintain the speed at 70 kilometers per hour whatever the value that we set because we are climbing a hill the vehicle will automatically increase the cruise control system will automatically increase the engine rpm in order to maintain the speed when the en engine increased its rpm that means you set it to the sweet spot but the cruise control system automatically increase the rpm that means the fuel consumption will be again increased therefore uh, this is something that could happen in our highway system as well because there are some places where you will find uh, some uh, uh, steep hills uh, some examples are if you are traveling from uh, the cardover Kado direction to kottava right before the kottava interchange uh, you can see this type of uh, uh, hill and then if you are having cruise control when you are closer to that region then you may have realized that the engine rpm is automatically increasing in order to maintain the speed another very good example is let's say if you are traveling in the uh, uh, the airport highway the airport highway just after paliagoda just after paliagoda uh, the newly newly made bridge uh, you you may have seen that there is a steep hill very steep hill upward hill uh, before it uh, merge with the the baseline road so at that point as well you can you may have experienced that that if you are using cruise control then the engine rpm will be increased i mean it will increase that it will rev very high so in such occasions remember that cruise control is not actually a good solution so in in such occasions get the the, the authority to your hands or to your foot and then try to maintain the rpm in uh, in somewhere in the lower region between 2000 to 3000 and so that you you will lose the speed obviously but you will uh, save some fuel that is how you smartly use the cruise control okay depending on the situation cruise control may or may not be the best option for the uh, better fuel economy then this is a very important part one of my favorite section maybe you, you all of you may have uh, you may be uh, waiting for this part whether to use the air conditioner or not okay so how to set the air conditioner what is the best what is the sweet spot of the air conditioning system okay how to uh, how what is the fan speed what is the temperature that i'm going to set so there are plenty of questions related to air conditioner Therefore, I have divided the air conditioning part into two sections. Uh, one is for a vehicle without an automatic climate control. 
some vehicles, you all know that there's a system called climate control. I come to that later. Let's say your vehicle is only having a conventional air conditioning system. Conventional air conditioning system, like the one that you can see in the figure. In a conventional air conditioning system, you can see a controller like this. You can see a controller like this. Usually the left half of the con controller is in blue color and the right half of the controller is in red color. Okay, that means the left half is kind of the, the cooling and the right half is kind of heating. And there's another switch for AC, switching on and switching off the air conditioning system. Uh, like uh, when we need to accelerate the vehicle, we, like all days, what we had done is like, switch off the air conditioner, like switch off the, uh, simply push the air conditioning button, turn off the air conditioner. That means the AC compressor will turn off and then you can have a very nice, like we used to say that like we are like the turbo boost of a car. Like the, the Knight Rider had the, the special turbo boost system, but the, the turbo boost system that we had in the conventional cars, the conventional vehicles is that simply switching off the air conditioner and then yes, you can accelerate. And then yes, you have another controller like to uh, control the flaps, uh, control the, 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 the ducts where the air conditioning, the, the, the air is flowing through, whether it is like uh, uh, directly to your face or to your foot, or maybe uh, directing towards the, the, the windscreen. So that is kind of a, uh, a controller that uh, uh, select what kind of select the airflow path and then this one I believe you know that uh, it's uh, the, the fan speed controller the fan speed controller and this this button it is actually the uh, the one that uh, uh, select whether the air is sucked from the external environment or whether the air is circulated inside the cabin the best option is that, okay, uh, keep the air circulated inside, okay. Mistakenly, sometimes it happens. Mistakenly, you set it into the outdoor air circulation mode. Mistakenly. So, outdoor air circulation mode means all the time, the air conditioning system gets air from the external environment. So, the external environment, air is usually hot. So the air conditioning system needs to do more and more work in order to cool down that hot air coming from the external environment. But as long as you maintain it in the internal, indoor air circulation mode, internal air circulation mode, okay? This is the symbol. Uh, once you go to the, your vehicle, it doesn't matter whether in any kind of air conditioning system with or without climate control, this you would see. Usually the symbol is like a, a car with an arrow like this. A car, uh, inside the car, there's an arrow like this. That is in indoor air circulation mode. And the outdoor air cir circulation mode means you can see an arrow coming from the outside of that car into the cabin. Okay, not like this, not like a, a looped arrow, but that arrow is coming from out to the inside of the car. So that is outdoor air circulation mode. Usually as long as you maintain uh, the, uh, uh, the indoor circulation, air circulation mode, that means the, the load that the AC compressor need to uh, bear in order to cool down the cabin will be very less. So if you mistakenly put it into outdoor air circulation mode, go and check and put it into the indoor air circulation mode. There are certain instances that you might need air coming from the outside. Let's say you are kind of traveling at a very, a very long distance and it's like the air is circulating inside and inside and the carbon dioxide will be accumulated inside the cabin. And uh, sometimes you might feel a bit uh, tired because of that, because the amount of oxygen inside the cabin will be depleted. In such cases, yes, then switch it to the outdoor air circulation mode, and then some fresh air will coming out from coming from the external environment into the cabin, and uh, keep it for some time. Okay, maybe a, a couple of minutes, and then you can go back to the internal or indoor air circulation mode. Okay, so you check that. So that is a very important part of your air conditioning system. 
and then yes how to set the this dial so this is the most important part this controller it actually set the temperature of the air conditioning system even though it might not show you the temperature but it is kind of a temperature a, a kind of a thermostat a temperature controller like your domestic air conditioning system at your homes like you can control the temperature using the remote control this is also some kind of a temperature controller temperature controller what is the basic practice okay you may have seen this in uh, in your day to day life the basic practice is any any uh, maybe uh, like uh, driver any driver usually when you go to inside go go inside a vehicle you may have seen that this figure this gauge is rotated to the leftmost corner or the end of the blue region end of the blue region if you rotate it to the end of the blue region that means you are setting the temperature to the lowest temperature lowest temperature that the the air conditioning system is trying to reach trying to reach usually the temperature is around 16 degrees celsius 16 usually that is the lowest temperature 16 degrees celsius in our country in our country 16 degrees means like if we reach 16 degrees that means it is not thermally comfortable at all okay you will not be able to stay inside a cabin which is a kind of cooled to 16 degrees celsius no cannot but uh, the thing is when you set it to that lowest temperature the ac compressor the air conditioning system will maintain running the ac compressor and it will try really hard always the compressor is always running until it reaches 16 degrees celsius until it reaches 16 degrees celsius but it will never happen it will never happen in our country usually our normal temperature maybe about 28 or how hard the compressor works okay how hard the compressor tries you will never reach 16 degrees celsius but the compressor is continuously trying to reach 16 degrees celsius therefore the compressor will never turn off the compressor will never turn off therefore you are going to lose a significant amount of fuel more and more fuel will be uh, consumed because a some part of the engine load is actually consumed by the ac compressor that we all all know that you all know so what you need to do is you need to find a proper place to set the temperature controller okay so not the low the 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 most uh, blue point okay you try to start rotating clockwise okay from the blue region slightly rotate slightly rotate and then at one stage one point let's say your vehicle is stationary you can you can test this while the vehicle is stationary not while traveling okay not while traveling keep the vehicle stationary engine is on and you rotate it clockwise little by little and then once it is on the very leftmost point then the compressor is running actually the compressor is running the ac ac is on at one point once you rotate it little by little then uh, you can feel that the compressor switched off at one point when you try to rotate it clock, count clockwise little by little and then at one point the compressor will switch off compressor will switch off the compressor will switch off means that let's say at that point the cabin air temperature is around let's say 26 degrees now the ac was on ac was on outside temperature is about 28 or maybe 29 28 let's say outside temperature is 28 inside temperature is at the moment 26 at the moment 26 that means 26 is more than enough 26 is a very comfortable temperature for us 26 but since it is in the most uh, leftmost point of the controller ac is trying to reach 16 but it does not go beyond 26 because how hard it tries it does not go below 26 now 
you rotate it clockwise a little by little little by little and at one point you will realize that the compressor will be automatically switched off automatically switched off so that means yes the controller is exactly set at that particular temperature if the inside temperature is 26 degrees celsius the controller while you are rotating to the clock, clockwise direction clockwise direction when the compressor releases or compressor turned off that means yes that is the the point that we need to find if you feel that the temperature the inside the temperature is good the temperature is more comfortable okay you feel that okay now it is uh, very comfortable not too cool not too hot comfortable then in that point yes you try to turn it uh, clockwise 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 until the compressor turned off so that is kind of a very good or very sweet spot where you can keep the temperature controller at maybe after some time you feel maybe the compressor is not turning on again compressor is not turning on again and you feel a bit hot inside inside then what you can do is slightly rotate slightly rotate the controller to the counterclockwise direction once you rotate it slightly to the left direction the like increasing the blue increasing the blue blue gauge just going into the increasing direction in the blue region slightly rotate it to the counterclockwise direction the compressor will turn on and starts air, start the air conditioning system so you try to stay in that region stay in that region not the leftmost point okay and also you may change the fan speed accordingly okay you, you you have the flexibility you have the flexibility to change the fan speed but the the majority of the engine load is actually uh, controlled by the temperature gauge not the fan speed not the fan speed but the temperature gauge this one this one plays the major part not the fan speed so you can set the fan speed you can set the fan speed and then according to your your preference but you need to be very careful when selecting the temperature using the temperature control and that is how you set the temperature of a vehicle without an automatic climate control if you go into a vehicle with automatic climate control it is very easy it is very easy maybe you can set it to 26 degrees celsius i remember when i was uh, studying in singapore uh, in every building in every building in singapore they have put a notice uh, it is kind of a notice i think uh, 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 printed by uh, uh, energy authority some kind of an energy authority in singapore saying that set the temperature of the air conditioner to 26 so they were saying that that will uh, reduce the load into their electrical grid while giving you a very comfortable environment 26 degrees celsius okay you can set it you can set the temperature to 26 degrees celsius and put it in the auto mode put it in the auto mode okay don't go into the manual mode Put it in the auto mode then the the vehicle air conditioning system will automatically switch on and switch off the the compressor accordingly okay we do not need to worry and the system will try to maintain the cabin temperature at 26 degrees all the time 26 degrees all the time accordingly it will also change the air conditioning vents okay sometimes it will just blowing air through the air vents right next to you okay in front of you sometimes it will automatically switch to the the air vents that is kind of directed towards your foot okay likewise the air conditioning system automatically changes some of its parameters in order to maintain the temperature at 26 degrees celsius okay in case let's say if the outdoor temperature uh, goes below 26 outdoor temperature is like 25 or 24 that means outdoor is very cool okay outdoor is very cool and then 26 means that 
it's kind of uh, now the heating system is automatically turned on so in order to outdoor temperature is 24 if there is no air conditioning working that means inside the temperature or inside vehicle also having 24 so once you set it to 26 the automatic climate control system will not switch on the air conditioning system but it will automatically turn on the heating system and increase the temperature inside the cabin to 26. So, in like in the, the conventional car, you do not need to rotate that knob. You do not have to rotate. You just have to set the temperature 26 and then the climate control system will do everything okay, automatically. Now, in the morning, let's say, in the morning, it's already cool. Okay, you do not need to like, uh, it's already outside temperature, maybe about 27 degrees or 28 degrees. So that is maybe in the morning that is a bit comfortable. Then in that time, during that time, you do not need to have set it to 26. You can go even higher, 27 or 28, as long as you feel comfortable. One thing that you need to remember is that, like in the previous case, do not set it to low. Okay. You can set the temperature to low or the lowest temperature, usually 16 degrees. If you set it to low, that means the compressor will be running all the time. Okay. Because the climate control system is trying to get the temperature inside the cabin to 16, which is impossible, but it will try. It will try by continuously running the compressor. Therefore, never to set it to low. Never to set it to low. Then this one is something that you usually uh, really do not care about, okay? The tire pressure. In order to in, improve your fuel efficiency, fuel economy, remember the tire pressure also very important because under inflated tires, okay? Under inflated, that means not enough air inside the tires. So the tire is kind of, uh, 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 like pushed or compressed, compressed and uh, uh, it's kind of pressed towards the, the road. Therefore, the rolling resistance or the resistance between the tires and the road becomes greater, especially when the, the tires are under inflated, not inflated enough. Then when the rolling resistance increases, that means you have to, the vehicle the engine needs to consume more and more fuel in order to overcome the rolling resistance. Okay? So, maintaining the tire pressure, that doesn't mean that pumping 35 PSI to all the wheels. No, no, that is totally incorrect. Okay, that, but usually, but that what happens when you go to a, uh, uh, where the, go to a, uh, like, uh, the, the tire station tire station doesn't matter doesn't matter the type of the car brand doesn't matter uh, 35 psi to all the wheels okay all the all the tires 35 psi no that is that is totally incorrect okay learn or you should know know the correct tire pressures for the tires of your car or your vehicle okay some vehicles, all the tires uh, should be pumped uh, evenly, okay? Same pressure, same pressure, like maybe 32 for all the tires. But there are cars, uh, kind of uh, a, 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 diff, a type of a, a level of a pressure, one significant level of pressure to front two wheels and another level of pressure to the rear two wheels. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, Toyota Prius C or uh, Toyota Aqua, Toyota Aqua, basically Toyota Aqua. The front, the recommended pressure for the front front tires, okay, according to uh, yes, now, the last time when I checked for uh, with the Prius C, the front tires thirty three psi, rear tires thirty two. But for Viva Light, two thousand eleven Viva Light, both front and rear twenty nine psi. If you take this car to a, a pumping station or tire shop, they will simply pump 35 PSI, 35 PSI to all the wheels. So that is not recommended by the way. So either 
you tell the, the maintenance people to pump the correct amount. You let them know that, okay, the front two wheels, 33, rear two wheels, 32. Otherwise, have a portable uh, air pump, 12 volts air pump for you inside the vehicle, have it inside the vehicle. Because in case of a uh, uh, fuel, uh, sorry, the air leakage, yes, this will be quite helpful as well as it will be quite helpful for you to maintain the tire pressure within the recommended level by yourself. You do not have to go to a tire shop. Okay. So remember that. That is also very important. And remove unwanted items from your vehicle. Okay. Travel light. Travel light. As long as the weight of the vehicle is less, the amount of uh, fuel consumed by the engine will be less. Okay. These are like the, the, we are kind of going towards the end of today's session. So this might be a very small thing, but it actually affects the fuel consumption. And this is something very important. You may have not even thought about it, okay? Some of you may have already, like, practicing periodic maintenance. Exactly at 5,000 kilometers or, or 10,000 kilometers, you go to the maintenance shop and do the periodic maintenance. So this is also very important in order to maintain a very good fuel economy. Replace the oil. Replace the oil filter uh, within the correct uh, time or distance intervals. That is kind of mentioned in your uh, handbook. That is mentioned in the handbook. So um, some vehicles, it's like 5,000 kilometers or six months. Some vehicles, 10,000 kilometers or six months or maybe even, even higher number of months. And depending on, they always refer to owner's manual, the manufacturer's recommendations. Change or clean the air filters. And after some time, or maybe after 20,000 kilometers or 40,000 kilometers or 6,000 kilometers, the manufacturers usually recommend a major service. Major service. In a major service, usually, uh, if it is a petrol vehicle, usually they uh, take the throttle body and clean the throttle body, clean the injectors. If the injectors are faulty, replacing the injectors, replacing the spark plugs, changing the engine coolant, and that is also usually the major service will cost you a bit more okay but some of you might not go to this major service because you might feel like okay the vehicle is running smoothly well, no problem with the vehicle so what should i do i need to clean the throttle body and clean the injectors well, no it's working fine it's working fine so we can go ahead that is not a good practice by the way because in maintenance, uh, there are two major categories like uh, preventive maintenance and breakdown maintenance. Preventive maintenance means, yes, you do all these services in the correct time or current kilometers. Okay, so that by doing that, you will prevent a, 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 a potential breakdown. Okay, don't wait until your vehicle breaks down. So try to stay and try to do preventive maintenance so that follow the manufacturers uh, the owner's manual with that with that i am going to give you a few tips okay few tips directly from toyota a few tips given directly from toyota about how to drive a hybrid vehicle. Okay, these are like not the like not the ones that you usually see in the internet, but this information is actually directly coming from Toyota. Okay, now see how it tallies with uh, the things that I have said previously. Now this is actually I have taken this from this book. Okay, this book, uh, it's, it's actually Toyota Prius C. I don't know whether you can, it's not clear, by the way. Yes, uh, maybe if I, um, okay, maybe later I will show you. Uh, anyway, yes, it's here. It's here. I have put it here. It is Toyota 
uh, for Prius C. Prius C is uh, uh, the, the Toyota Aqua, the Toyota Aqua's uh, the international model, international model, Toyota Prius C. It's not Prius actually, it's very similar to Toyota Aqua. Information guide, it's, it's from Japan. It's from Japan, this document is, uh, is coming with the vehicle. In this, in this document, for better driving, for better driving, these are the information given by Toyota. This is a very interesting thing, right? This is a very interesting. I'll tell you, this is a very uh, kind of a, uh, a practice uh, that you can do. You may have not known about this. So I don't know whether you have, uh, you know about this, but let's go through. When depressing the accelerator pedal, when pressing the accelerator pedal, after accelerating, after accelerating, okay, to uh, the required amount of acceleration, let's say you accelerate to 50 kilometers per hour. So, so that is the required speed to accelerate. Now the engine is also running, engine is also running. Well, you accelerate it to 50 and then you are going to maintain the speed. Now, if you keep the accelerator pedal at that point, okay, 50 kilometers at that point, maybe the engine will not automatically turn off. There's a way to do that. There's a way that you can manually switch off the engine. Manually switch off the engine. How to do that? Release the accelerator pedal. Release the accelerator pedal and gently depress it again. Okay? Gently depress it. Once you release the accelerator pedal, immediately the engine will switch off. And then when you gently depress it again, the vehicle will come to EV mode or the motor dominant mode automatically. I don't know whether you have practiced this or you have an experience on this. If you are driving a Toyota hybrid, a Toyota hybrid, this is something that you can do. Okay, once you reach the acceleration that you require and uh, immediately release the accelerator pedal and gently depress it. And then you can get into the electric vehicle mode. Okay, and when depressing the brake pedal, Depress the brake pedal gently and allow plenty of time for braking. Yes, like uh, slow down gently, slow down gently, gently. Let the regenerative braking system to uh, regenerate and charge the battery pack. Okay. When encountering delays, let's say you are in a traffic, okay, slowly moving, slowly moving traffic, use the accelerator pedal as little as possible, okay? It's like if you need to move forward a little bit, you just take the foot out of the brake pedal and let the vehicle to move automatically. Do not press the accelerator pedal. Just let the vehicle go, okay? Only if required, you can make, push the accelerator pedal if the gap is becoming too high, but otherwise, just release the brake pedal and let it go, okay? And, yeah, those three things, hang on. And when driving at high speeds, drive at moderate and constant speed. Yes, we discussed it previously because in order to maintain the sweet spot, okay, sweet RPM, drive at moderate speeds, moderate speed, not too high, not too low, moderate speeds while hitting that sweet spot of the engine and also maintain the speed constant. And actually, this reminds me something related to uh, the highway driving. Okay, highway driving. In highway driving, there is some kind of a gray area whether you uh, should use the air conditioner or not. Okay, whether uh, whether you are going to save some fuel uh, by switching on the air conditioner or uh, uh, by sorry switching off the air conditioner. There are two sides of it, two sides. By switching off the air conditioner, yes, the, uh, the compressor will stop working. That means, yes, you are going to save some fuel. But in the meantime, you have to open the windows, open the windows. Once you open the windows, the oncoming air will start getting into the vehicle and it will increase the aerodynamic drag acting on your vehicle, aerodynamic drag. When the vehicle 
is experiencing a huge amount of aerodynamic drag in order to overcome the aerodynamic drag the engine needs to combust more and more fuel so maybe you are saving fuel by turning off the air conditioner but at the same time since your windows are open and the air is kind of incre increasing the drag force because there's the, now the body is not streamlined usually the car bodies are made very streamlined so the air hitting the front of the car go around the vehicle go around the vehicle very smoothly very smooth flow but when the windows are open that air will come into the vehicle so the air flow will not be smooth that will increase the amount of drag acting on the vehicle so in order to overcome the drag the vehicle needs to spend more and more fuel if it is a hybrid vehicle if it is a hybrid vehicle i believe that you may have experienced that when you are traveling at a constant speed in the highway the battery system the battery is gradually charging that battery is, if the battery is at the bottom let's say maybe you are just traveling maybe about 500 meters or maybe 1 kilometer within that time the vehicle is con is traveling at a constant speed and also the battery is charging but usually battery will come to its maximum point fully charged so in hybrid that means that the vehicle is actually having ample amount of energy kinetic energy from the engine that can be utilized to charge the battery pack the engine is having ample amount of kinetic energy while maintaining the speed and also it can charge the battery pack and you know that in hybrid vehicles the compressor is is run by the battery the hybrid battery the compressor is run by the hybrid battery i believe you know that when the engine is having ample amount of energy to charge the battery system okay uh, there's no point of turning on turning off the air conditioning system because when you are traveling on the highway there's ample amount of energy from the engine not only to drive the vehicle enough energy to charge the battery enough energy to charge the battery which means enough energy to Drive, uh, uh, drive the air conditioning system. So you are not actually going to save a significant amount of energy by switching off the air conditioner because when you are traveling on the highway, you have enough energy in the vehicle uh, to drive, like uh, additional energy, additional energy, I must say, to charge the battery, charge the battery. So use that energy, the energy to keep the air conditioner running. Another advantage here is that hope you know that in most of the hybrids the hybrid battery is cooled by a, a cooling fan uh, the air for that cooling fan the air that goes through the battery pack is taken from the cabin of the car the air inside the cabin inside the car is taken through the the hybrid uh, the battery pack uh, the fan of the battery pack and cooled down the batteries if the air conditioning system is not running, that means if the air conditioning system is running, that means the, the air inside the cabin is maybe around 26 degrees Celsius. So that cool air is going through the battery system and cooling down the battery pack. If we are not using the air conditioning system, that means the air inside the vehicle could be, uh, the temperature could be the same as the air outside. So let's say the temp temperature of the air is about 28 or 29 degrees Celsius. So that hot air is going to go through the hybrid battery pack. So you are actually trying to push hot air into the battery pack. Yes, obviously there can there will be a heat exchange because inside the battery pack the temperature may be even greater. So some amount of energy uh, heat energy can be absorbed by the 29 degrees air, but still it is hot. If the temperature or the air is in 20, at 26 degrees Celsius, that means we are pushing cool air into the hybrid battery so that the heat transfer from the battery to the air will be very efficient so that the battery pack can be cooled down very easily. So that is one advantage of keeping the air conditioner running in order to improve the, the lifespan of the hybrid battery. And yes, it's 
This one is when the vehicle is stopped, uh, shift it to the P gear, not to N. That I believe you know that uh, when it, the gear is on N or neutral, uh, the engine, if the engine cannot charge the battery pack, okay? The engine might be turned on, but it will not charge the battery pack. So the engine can charge the battery pack only when it is in P position, R position, or D or B. Okay, so it's drive, parking position, reverse position, drive position, or the uh, engine braking position. But when the gear is in N, the engine actually cannot charge the battery pack. Therefore, when the vehicle is stopped, okay, uh, you can keep it in D, or uh, if required, you can put it to P, but not to N. The last one we already discussed, the tire pressure, tire pressure. So with that, I believe uh, you have learned something. There's some some of the things you may have already knew, but I believe some of the things you may have not known previously. And uh, I believe that maybe some of the tips and tricks that I have discussed with you could be very useful for you to save some fuel save some fuel. And uh, I see that uh, there's a question uh, from um, uh, Mafas. Is it okay to turn off the engine often of uh, Vego? Vego, I believe it's Toyota. Uh, ah, Vego bike. Ah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Vego bike automatic to save fuel. When go down from the hill, will it affect the engine? Um, if it is an automatic if it, it's an automatic transmission, like it, it's, a, it's a scooter, it's a scooter. So it is, okay. I mean, um, the thing is that most of these bikes, they usually do not have a uh, automatic fuel cutoff system because still they are using conventional carburetor to mix the air fuel mixture. So the carburetor is something that is not electronically controlled. Therefore, if the bike is running and if, uh, the vehicle is traveling on a hill, then the piston is actually moving up and down very fast. And there is a chance of uh, 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 sucking more fuel into the, uh, into the system. There is a chance, there is a chance. But if you switch off, okay, to save fuel, it, I mean, if you switch off, if you switch off, then what would happen is that, uh, as long as the engine is on, as long as the engine is on, the engine is actually connected to the gearbox and then to the wheels. If you are going downhill, if you switch off the engine, then the, the rear wheel will start spinning freely, freely without having the, the, the inertia of the engine. It's like, uh, like there's no engine braking. There's something that we usually practice, something called as engine braking. When you are going downhill, it's always to keep the engine running and the, en uh, the gear, gear is engaged. As long as the wheel, gearbox, and the engine is connected, then when you are going downhill, there's a restriction or, or there's some kind of uh, uh, engine braking, we call it. Uh, so that the, the speed of the vehicle will not highly increase when you are going downhill. Okay, just maintaining the, that is what we call as engine braking. Without using the brakes, the engine's inertia, the engine's inertia is kind of trying to slow down the vehicle because the wheel is rotating, try to rotate because we are going downhill, the vehicle, the wheel is trying to rotate very fast. But the wheel is connected to the gearbox and the gearbox is trying to kind of, since we are not accelerating, since we are not accelerating, so the engine is only providing fuel for idling, only for idling. Therefore, the gearbox is kind of providing some inertia to the wheel as well as the engine is providing inertia to the wheels. Therefore, you will be able to maintain the speed, okay, without using the brakes. But if you switch off, if you switch off, then there's a chance of losing engine braking, losing engine braking. Therefore, uh, since 
like when the vehicle is like it's, in, it's kind of in neutral position okay when the the bike is switched off okay you know that the bike can be pushed okay very easily that means there's no connection between the gearbox and the engine there's no connection between the gearbox and the engine therefore when there is no connection between the gearbox and the engine if you are going downhill the the rear the speed of the rear wheel will continuously increase and increase so then you might have to use the brakes to maintain the speed fuel point of view yes uh, uh, mr mafas fuel point of view yes you will be able to save fuel by switching off okay that is for sure but safety point of view okay uh, you will have to use the brakes to maintain the speed okay but uh, as long as the engine is running uh, since because of the inertia of the engine you will not need to use the brakes much okay so safety point of view and also the the longevity or lifespan of the brake pads point of view uh, keeping the engine running is good but in the point of fuel maybe switching off the engine is good so according to my opinion my opinion is that uh, the amount of fuel that you are going to save uh, is very less when compared to compromising safety of the bike or compromising safety of yourself as well as the bike as well as the brake shoes therefore my advice is like yeah try to keep the engine running and use the engine braking to make sure that you are in the safe zone okay i believe i uh, yes uh, i explained uh, the mr muhammad mufaz uh, question and yes thank you thank you dilip thank you saman any advantage of 95 over 92 regarding the fuel economy most of the japanese cars most of the japanese cars that you see in your daily life uh, like toyota aqua toyota prius uh, Uh, Yaris, Belta, Grace, uh, Vessel. I believe most of these domestic cars uh, require only ninety-one octane, ninety-one, not even ninety-two. Okay, so usually the ninety-five octane is required for high compression engines. High compression engines, like there is something like more technical terms uh, related to mechanical engineering or automotive engineering. Uh, usually these all the domestic cars that we use in our day to day life does not are not actually high compression engines yeah that is the reason why from toyota from the company they recommend 91 is more than enough 91 is more than enough so we have 92 so if the the engine manufacturer recommends 91 and uh, there's no point of fueling 95 okay you are not going to save anything it's something psychological by the way okay it's something psychological because sometimes when once you pump 95 fuel you feel maybe uh, maybe there's a slight increase improvement in the fuel economy slight slightly slightly but that is purely psychological or oh, it could be um, something that you change in your driving style slight changes could happen but technical wise these japanese engines are designed for 91 91 so 92 is more than enough 92 is more than enough for cvt how to find that sweet spot i have come to listen to the engine sound and see fuel consumption rates to identify however since cvt is cvt is in the whole thing a giant sweet spot um uh not quiet actually not quiet so even though if you are using a, a continuously variable transmission system uh, the amount of fuel consumption yes you can see it clearly in front of the dashboard i mean it, most of the these vehicles are having a a real time uh, fuel consumption gauges fuel consumption gauges so it, let's say in the initial stages that you try to flow the accelerator pedal to the bottom okay then in the cvt system it will continuously change the size of the pulley okay immediately change the size of the pulley 
and so that the engine RPM will increase uh, since you are adding more fuel to the system, so they can accelerate very quickly, very quickly. So what we need to do in the CVT system is that, yes, as you mentioned that, let the CVT system to select the proper gear ratio, but what as a driver, what you can do is try to uh, do not try to push the accelerator pedal too hard. As you mentioned that if your vehicle does not have a RPM gauge, if it does not have a RPM gauge, then the, the easiest way is monitor, uh, monitor on the flat road, on the flat road, monitor uh, the, the real time fuel consumption readings the real time fuel consumption readings so that is how you basically can find the sweet spot sweet spot i mean it's very difficult to hit a sweet spot it's very difficult to hit a sweet spot but try to figure out what is the range what is the range so then try to stay within that range okay my father's right for conventional auto is it easier to find yes yes the uh, yes i believe it's Oh, yeah, Lekam gear. Yes, it's very easy to find if it is a conventional one. Usually, the conventional auto gears, like uh, I believe, the, 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 the I think that's the uh, you saw the Yaris you had. Uh, it's kind of, it had the RPM gauge. It's very easy yeah. to find. Yeah, it's very easy to find. Yeah, good, it says. Uh, what is the importance of Echo tablet? There is actually a quite controversial thing. Okay, these days actually they are kind of promoting the eco tablet. Uh, this this kind of uh, these are actually octane boosters. Okay, we call these things uh, octane boosters. Now, uh, like if the vehicle only requires octane ninety one, and we are getting ninety two at least, technically there's no point of using octane boosters. Okay, because like. It requires 91. We already have 92. There's no point of increasing the octane number because the engine is not designed for that. Engine is uh, usually our engines are, as I said, low compression engine. I mean, sorry, not low compression. It's like, uh, yeah, look, yeah, compression ratio is low. Compression ratio, something technical, something related to automotive. Usually, the, the domestic car engines, the compression ratio is somewhere at the low end not high compression ratio engines. So this increasing the octane number is required for the engines that require uh, high compression ratios, high compression ratios. So if your vehicle is only requires 91, actually there's no point of using any octane boosters. I mean, there's a high, I mean, there's a highly doubtful situation whether these, uh, these, these, these tablets actually boost the octane because there's uh, nobody has actually done any study. Okay, so maybe it's it's a good time for for like uh, for some researchers to do some studies uh, whether the effectiveness of these uh, octane boosters. But if you are driving a conventional one, conventional car, actually the recommended octane number for your particular vehicle, you can simply search in the Google. There are plenty of websites which gives you a very long list, very long list. All the cars that you see in our, our uh, roads, you can see that, you can see that the, 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 uh, recom with the recommended octane number. So as long as we have 92, I mean, there's a problem actually that whether we do not know that uh, the quality of the fuel that we are getting these days. So assuming that we are getting 92, so then the vehicle is recommended, recommend, the recommended limit is 91. Then for that such vehicle, there's no point of using any octane boosters. Like they're, they're just wasting money. Okay. So I believe that uh, yeah, I have answered to all the questions that, uh, that I got in the chat box. So yes, thank you very much all the people who attended today's session and uh, thank you very much Dr. Sajit Ajirisingha for inviting me to this uh, I might say maybe a timely webinar and also I would like to thank all the, 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 
members of the staff development committee of the faculty of medical sciences of university of shijawardenepura and uh, yeah if you have any questions i, I mean uh, uh, you have my email address so that is uh, uh, let me put it in uh, here l i h l s at orm.lk uh, so this is my email address if you have any questions feel free to drop an email and yeah finally yes may feel be with you all thank you